Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Maretta Holm-Brandsberg, probably saying that a bit wrong, I'm sure she can correct me. Uh, she is the founder of Relational Trauma Therapy and a specialist in hypo state. So we have a lot of people on about trauma, and I think she's a real specialist that's going to add a lot. Uh, you know, we'll move beyond the basics, I think, today. So Maretta, welcome. Thank you. Where are you in the world today? Uh, I'm in southern Sweden in our uh, cottage. Okay. And are you Swedish? Are you Danish? No, uh, I'm in... not. I'm Danish. I'm That's Danish. What I, thought. I That's live what in I thought. Copenhagen. Yeah. Okay. It's nice to have a guest on who isn't from Britain or America. We try and keep it a bit broader than that. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in the body and in trauma? And um, what, what was your story in, in getting interested in this area? Uh, it started early. Um, uh, in a way, it started without me knowing it. But getting interested in the body happened when I was around 20. I had dropped a university career uh, because it didn't work for me. I got, I got a hint from one of my friends about a psychomotor school. Uh, I, and I jumped into that. And that really turned me on. So psychomotor is, is really about it's working with muscles. It's working with touch, but also with basic exercises. And we're getting awareness of all the potential that lies in the muscle system. And uh, that, that was a big thing for me when I was young. I was 20 when I started. And it really, um, uh, you could say, it did two things to me. It, it uh, helped me gain a lot more access to my own free life energy, uh, sensuality. A lot parts of my body awakened that I hadn't known were not really on board. Um, that was the very positive thing about it. The, the more challenging thing was that it didn't last. So I had this, this um, experience that I by now know is very normal, which is that you, you can relatively easily gain resources from working bodily, but the different thing is to make it sustainable. How, how do we keep it? How do we actually integrate it? And uh, I didn't understand that by then. I just got, got it the hard way. You know, I gained resources, I lost them. I gained them, I lost them. This roller coaster process. And what I know today is that that basic experience when I was around from 20 and my early 20s, it has really formed my work because it, it, it both showed me a huge potential in working with, with the psychomotor uh, knowledge and gaining resources, psychological resources that way, opening up patterns. But it also showed me that in a way something was missing. And that's what I have worked my way into by focusing on hypostates. That was a long explanation. No, no, that is how it started in, for me. Diving straight into it. So uh, when you say psychomotor, is that a particular school or are you just talking generally? I'm, I'm not clear what that is. Well, in, it, it is a general tradition it's quite strong in scandinavia this uh -huh. understanding uh -huh. of that the psychological development connects very is interlinked with the motoric development so there's quite a lot of, of psychological literature in that which is broad and then there's this um then there are some specific psychomotor schools some of them are within physiotherapy this one wasn't this was this school was in the tradition that's called relaxation therapy, or it was called back then. Today it's called psychomotor therapy. Um, but this, but that school different. grew out of the relaxation. Um, okay, and this is a whole other tradition than, than say dance movement therapy. It is a different tradition. Yeah, they have some they have some parallels. Uh, both of them uh, gained inspiration from some of the. Um, uh, dance and theater uh, folks. I know I have forgotten their names, but um, Stanislavski, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he inspired yeah. both both of these um, paths. Okay. One of them went into dance uh, therapy, and one of them went into relaxation therapy. Laban is another one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
you could say there is some similarity, but in the practical way of working, they are not similar. Uh huh. And this is fascinating to me. Is that the Anglo kind of schools have got very famous, and I, you know, I came across something the other day that's huge in France, and I'd never heard of. And someone oh. said, "Oh, you're running the embodiment conference, and you haven't heard of blah yeah. blah 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 blah." And I was yeah. just like, "I've never heard of that." And just because it's no. French speaking and it's all in French and it's done in France yeah. and, you know, maybe a yeah. million people do it, but I've never heard of it. And the same in Germany, <laughs> the schools I've never heard of yeah. in Germany, they're just all in German. And then yeah. in Scandinavia, I come across a few and it just feels like the only ones we know about are the sort of Asian ones that have come through America or the American ones, you know, and very few yeah. of the sort of European ones yeah. ever get propagated more widely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, That's let's right. talk about Let's talk about hypostates a little bit then. That's one of your specialisms, as I understand it. Yeah. Tell us, let's start right at the beginning with the basics and then maybe we'll go more yeah. advanced. What is a hypostate? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do it a little broader. You could say what is hypo and what is hyper. Great. Right, because if we look at it from that perspective uh, and you look at the body, you can say hypo and hyper that's really under-functioning and over-functioning. And you can find that in many kinds of tissue. You can find it in the organs. Uh, you can find it in your blood pressure. You can have hypotension, hypertension. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have it in your blood sugar, right? You can, if you, if you look at it as just that either we are in balance, right? Or when we go out of balance, we can do it in two different ways. We can overdo something or we can underdo something. That's the very broad understanding of what hypo is about. It's something that's under-functioning, right? And then you could say in terms of trauma therapy, the types of hypo states I'm specialized in working with, they, they come from, they are in the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. So there we talk arousal and we can talk hyper arousal, which is what is by far the, still the most known. Mm-hmm. which is flight, fight, et cetera. It's all the active survival reactions. But then there's the whole other side, which is the hypo arousal, which is where we, it's not only that we look at, but it's we, we go down into almost a hibernating state, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is called hypo arousal, right? So that's the hypo state in the arousal system. And then what I'm even more a specialist in is to work with the hypo state in the muscle system. Okay. Right. So if we think of this psychomotor potential I talked about earlier, then, and we think hypo and hyper into that and balanced, then you could say if, if we have a balanced muscle, then it's just full of life energy. It's filled out. We have access to whatever, uh, impulses and psychomotor skills and emotions that connect to it. But if we're not that lucky, and we aren't, there are places in our body that are not where we don't have that full potential available. Then how is it we lose it? We can do that in two ways. The most known is that we tense up the muscles, we control them, we hold back, we then you get kind of a straight jacket in your body, uh, a lot of pressure, right? That's tension. Very yes. well-known phenomenon, yeah. right? Hyper response. And yes. then you also have this less known phenomenon, but just as normal, which is that we also lose the resource, the psychomotor resources through giving up in the muscles. Uh-huh. They go That's flaccid. Like, yeah, they go, they go, you lose, you literally lose the container function that a muscle is. The muscle holds a, a, a specific little part of your life energy and your action potential. And if the muscle fibers go flaccid, then that container for life energy and this specific expression of who you are isn't available anymore. Right? That's a, it's a phenomenon. In a way, we all know it. If you think of a handshake, mm-hmm. if you think of different types of handshakes you have experienced. Right, right. The <laughs> handful of carrots. Them? They right. call it in Sweden, the handful of carrots handshake. It's yes. a wonderful description. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, so you know this kind of handshake where you almost feel like your hand gets crushed. Uh huh. That that would be a very hyper one. Yeah, yeah. I had a military uncle right? did that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you you know handshake that just feels good. Just this contact. This then you have the experience of what a balanced, filled out muscle response feels like. And then you have these handshakes that are really not very pleasant. 
which are the ones that, that are flaccid, where the yeah. hand you're shaking isn't really present, or the energy isn't coming into the meeting. That's hypo response. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So to get it, we all know it. From real life, we all know this phenomenon. So it's not the phenomenon that's unusual. The unusual thing is to focus on it mm-hmm. and to conceptualize it. And with that, be able to develop methods that specifically address this phenomenon. Got it. And how might listeners relate to feeling this in their own body? I mean, is it different than just when you're exhausted and collapsed? Is it, you know, like when you're people who may have experienced being a bit depressed and just having that? Yeah. Is it that or is it something more than that? So, so the words you use now, are, they, they, act, they talk more to hypo arousal. Mm-hmm. When you say kind of depressed or collapsed, you talk about a very general sense mm-hmm. of losing energy in, in your whole being that would be something that happens more in your nervous system than only in specific parts of your muscle system. Okay. So the difference is if you want to track hypo-responsive muscles, you, you need to get curious about which parts of your muscle system is not really uh, filled out or engaged or awake. And the easiest way I know to help people do that is by comparison. Uh-huh. Like thinking, is there is there a first track your tensions, <laughs> which is what you probably did right now, right? You have something that's oh, I've not got a so stiff pleasant neck, in right? your neck. Um, yeah, you got a stiff neck. neck. Yeah, that's, so you track your tension, and that's mm-hmm. for most people that's relatively easy because they they bother us. The right, you can feel that tension. It's like, oh, can, my shoulders are stiff know, today. I, I really yeah. Know. It's kind of out and stiff and too much and sometimes painful. Mm. So if we start tracking that and then invite just a little relaxation of that, just to slow down enough to be curious the other side. We mm-hmm. can do that right now. You want okay. to guide us yeah, right, right now? Sure, why not? So, so let's just sit uh, relatively symmetrical, both feet in the floor and both sitting bones in contact with the chair. If you like that, find support from the chair in your back. And then notice these places that, that are, in a way, working too hard right now. And you, you spoke about your shoulders and your neck, right? They would be typical. For me, it's typically my diaphragm. I hold a little too much in my breathing. Another typical pattern for me is I tense up in the outside of my legs. I kind of, in a way, I over-contain. It could be your back. It could be your legs. Basically, it could be anywhere. So that's one first step, just to notice and acknowledge that we all have this. It's going on all the time. And then invite in that we can just slow down a little. Just Uh, And we'll slow down, I mean, settle into the chair, focus on breathing out, so that we invite the body to land a little. Just come down a little inwards. Yeah. And then we can just notice, does that make a difference? And I notice it right away. It it, uh, quiets down my voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, My voice comes from a little deeper place inside of me which actually feels nice right now. Um, I don't get less awake. I just get a little, I settle more. Do you have words for your version? Um, I'm a little sleepy today, so I'm definitely noticing yeah. that more when I, when I come in. I've had yeah. a long day. But yeah. Um, but yeah, also a feeling of calm, pleasantness, solid, solidity. Yeah. yeah. But this, this thing of, of feeling that you're tired, is it, that, I mean, that's a very natural uh, Uh, thing that happens when we slow down, then we suddenly start feeling some of the other parts of the body than the ones that are ready to be uh, on all the time. So you may not be the only one. There could be listeners who are in the same club. Oh, no. And also, I'm just tired. That's okay. It's 7, 18. I've been working since 9 p.m. It's normal, you know. 12-hour day or whatever. So 8 and 10-hour day. So, Yeah. yeah. Okay, we tired. So so that's the beginning, right? Of just 
getting into a state inside where it's a little easier to start getting curious about what's not present because that is naturally harder to track. It's easier to track something that's too much than it is to track something that is a little gone. Yes. But the experiment right now is to say, okay, let's compare. Then we have a better position inside to start being curious about what's not really there. What has less energy? What is, uh, yeah. So uh, let's do that. We can compare sides. Is there a difference between the energy level in right and left, in back side, front side, in outside, inside, in um, upper part, lower part? So these big comparisons can be a way of starting to just get curious. Where in the body could this less uh, noisy part of us be? That's the interesting thing, right? We're looking for something which is less noisy. So it's that's right. So it's like oh, I'm it's, it's quieter, it. right? It's a uh, it's a little more withdrawn, uh, often less noticed, um, very often less valued. Okay. Right. Uh, less paid attention to. And the whole mechanism is it, in it is to go invisible. So in a way, it's actually a success for the mechanism when we right. don't pay attention right. to it, right? Because the whole mechanism is that we can, we can, in a way, get rid of something or solve something that is a dilemma for us by, by not sensing it, by taking right. the energy out of it. It's smart. It's uh-huh. a brilliant mechanism. Uh-huh, right. uh-huh, uh-huh. But it has, unfortunately, it has some consequences because it leaves us with parts of us that we are not really in charge of anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So do you get any ideas about wh- when you make the comparisons? Do, do you get any information from that in your body? Yeah, I mean, over the years, I've done things like this and realized certain parts of me are more alive, more active, more present, you know. Yeah. For a long time, I couldn't feel my ankles. I, you know, I had no idea why. Yeah. You know, it was just like no. a part. I do a body yeah. scan in, in meditation. No matter how many body scans I did, I'd be like, I can't mm-hmm. feel that part of me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that could be one example, a specific part that's just more gone or less available. Right? My example is typically this. When we talked about the tension, I talked about the outside of my legs. Uh-huh. I kind of go, I, I, I tense up typically there. And mm-hmm. it counterparts that the inside has more hyper response, right? And and many of those patterns have that quality of two sides. Right, right. So, so one so part, you could, top half more, bottom half less, kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah or yeah, you yeah. could be more tense in your diaphragm, for example, uh, covering up that you have less energy in your core. Uh, you could be tense in your surface, and then. Uh, more hypo responsive in the depth muscles or vice versa, etc. So you, they, these two, they work together. It's not like it's either or. Right, right, it's much right. Much more like they, they, uh, they work together in defensive patterns. You reminded me, just an image came up of like a cockerel that has like these big feathers on the top and then these little uh-huh. j- skinny chicken legs yeah. going on underneath, you yeah. know, like one part's yeah. very obvious and one part's... Yes. Yeah, yeah, good picture. <laughs> yeah, maybe I feel that, is, that some days. But the top half is much bigger than the bottom. Yeah, yeah. and more visible and looks more looks stronger, right? And then there are these more hidden parts that are more invisible. And we we have those, we have that polarity in us, and are the ways we manage and the ways we survive have these this polarity. Wow, now I understand my love of chickens. Finally, we've analyzed it. We've analyzed my love of chickens. So, <laughs> so as, as I'm understanding this model, it's, it's not just like Stephen Porges' model of the whole nervous system going hypo, hypo but uh, like actually a bit more specific, almost like a neo reikian kind of model, that there's different parts with different things going on. Is, is that the kind of flavor here? Well, you could say the, the parallel to Reich is that Reich also uh, dealt with the muscle system. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, there's a parallel. When I talk about parts or I talk about um, muscle groups, it could be even more specific. The difference to Reich is that Reich was really primarily focused on armoring, mm-hmm. which in this language is hyper response. That's the tension, the tension right? right? It does the same thing of not feeling in yeah. a way, though, right? Because it, it does, but it does it in a different way. Uh-huh. 
uh, so not disappearing, it's disappearing it's, through that tension. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, there you, of course, you also lose access to your life energy when you really tense up, but you do it in a different way and you're left with two different problems. Okay. Right, with tension, you're left with that you're overworking. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was coaching someone yesterday and they were exhausting to be around. They were yeah. just exhausting because they were so wired, so yeah. tense. So tense. Yeah. And, yeah. You, and you, yeah. you overwork, you, you really push yourself and you lose access to a lot of nuances in, in what's going on inside of you because of all that tension. So that also comes with a cost. What doesn't happen is that you don't really lose your life energy. You just control it. Uh -huh. where the challenge with hypo-response is that you literally lose some of your life energy. When you say life energy, what do you mean by that? That's just kind yeah, of an esoteric concept the, for the okay. average person. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a terrible concept, but what are we going to call it? Right. Okay. It's a metaphor. It works for me. I'm, I'm just... just, just nah. uh, this, th this, this, uh, this phenomenon that fills us up, that makes us feel alive, mm -hmm. That uh, is the difference between a dead body and an alive body. What is that? What are we going to call that phenomenon? Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, different traditions would use different words. But basically, there is some juice or uh, there's a systemic tradition I got trained in that calls it the green stuff. The green stuff, like the green, <laughs> the green juice. Stuff. Green juice. We're back to some vegan uh, uh, trauma yeah. therapy. Here. Okay. But <laughs> what what should we call it? Huh. But it's. Do we have our? We could also say our full potential available. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, that's another, but it's just as broad. Okay. But if oh. I go back to what is it we lose in the yes. hypo response, right? We lose access to impulses because uh -huh. every single muscle holds a potential for uh, participating in in the uh, skills skills we use for managing whatever in our grounding our centering our reaching out in the world our boundaries our orienting capacity etc etc all of these basic coping skills they have a psychomotor aspect to them it's very yes. concrete that we turn our heads when we orient and that we feel the soles of our feet when we ground and that we have access to our core muscles when we feel our center inside of us, etc. Right? So if we speak that language, it becomes more concrete what it is we lose. Because if these muscles go flaccid, then we lose access to these skills. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, do you think this is missed out in a lot of trauma therapy today? I mean, as you say, fight flight's talked about a lot. Yes. People do talk about nervous system shutdown. I do hear that from like the somatic experiencing people. What do, you, what yeah. do you think this work adds to the current kind of trauma narrative? Um, today, there are more uh, trauma therapeutic traditions that include hypoarousal. If we go just 10 years back, uh, that was still unusual. And you can still find traditions within trauma therapy that are primarily focused on hyper arousal, mm -hmm. which would be the release of fight and flight and mm -hmm. other active um, survival reactions, right? Where today the field is broader. Uh, Stephen Porges has had a huge influence on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, different methodologies have developed um, that includes uh, hyper arousal also within the psychiatric uh, research world. It's not only within, within trauma therapy, it's also in research. Researchers like Ruth Lanius uh, include hypoarousal, etc. Okay. So that's not where I am. Uh, you could say I'm not the only one there. What I add is a very specific way of working with these hypostates. And I think that comes from my psychomotor background. Because if, if you're dealing with hypoarousal, you're dealing with a very big giving up. If you're dealing with hypo response, you're dealing with a smaller phenomenon. And it's easier to train people to start being able to accept and include and make peace with the small giving up 
than to start with the big one. Mm -hmm. It's easier to build up resilience, to widen the personality, to start accepting these phenomena when you work in a very concrete way with the muscles. And I think that is, it, that's particularly where I add something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, I think I first met you or came across you like eight, 10 years ago. And it, it strikes me the trauma world has changed massively since then. It has. You know what I mean? It's really become yeah. a big, big world, yeah. with a lot of yeah. systems and a lot of complexity yes. and people are kind of rock stars in that world. Yeah. Yeah, I love, you know, you've been in this world for a while. You've been doing this since you were 20 years old, you said. So it's, yeah. I guess that's a little while. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I know it's, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say how many years, but that's a while. So <laughs> what have you seen? <laughs> how, how long? 45. I'm 65. 45 years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you've seen, you must have seen a lot change yeah. things come and go i right. mean working right. in trauma longer than i've been alive so like w tell us about that that's like a w huge amount of experience i think we should all, all hear about the whole the whole change in how yeah what have you seen come and go what have you seen you know change how have you seen how is that being part of that world yeah. you know like just opening that yeah, up yeah yeah well if i go back to I mean, I started in body work when I was 20, which is in the middle of the 70s, 75 to 78. And the psychotherapy world back then was, uh, it was really about opening up. A lot of it was uh, cathartic. Yep, very a screaming, of, shouting. Uh, a lot of it was, uh, I mean, that's where, that's where um, Yano's uh, primal therapy was around. That's where, and, and so, so there was this huge belief in that what we needed was to, to uh, set, set, our, set the body free, right? Mm -hmm. Which basically is releasing tension. Uh, set it free, express emotions, mm -hmm. uh, uh, express them loudly, right? That mm -hmm. was the belief. And that's also, I mean, I was part of lots of experiments back then. Uh, okay. In different types of, of uh, psychotherapy, we were a group of people from the psychomotor school who went to workshops together. So I have been in that whole... Jump, screaming, shouting, yeah. throwing up in buckets. And, uh, and looking back, I can yeah. see that it probably... It, it, some of it was fun. Some of it was terrible. Some of it didn't make any difference. But in the long run, I do think it has prolonged my own trauma therapy process. Okay, right. Because it has it 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 strengthened the split in me between the parts of me that could join into this. Let's go for it, right? Mm -hmm. And part of me can do that. Part of me right. has energy enough to do that. But what has been the deepest challenge for me within my own trauma patterns? They have been lying in the hypo side, uh -huh. and there was there wasn't really. Uh, knowledge back then in trauma therapy about that mm -hmm. and basically that that's my personal reason for having um started focusing on it it was that something was missing that mm -hmm. no matter how much i uh, went into running and expressing and uh, then i was still left with that a while later i would drop into a deep uh, collapse again and then I would fight my way out because, uh, because I'm not the type of person who wants to look like a loser, you know, who wants to... So, so I, I have been fighting that side. And I do think that's not only me personally. I think that's how it worked back then. It's that, that we started, trauma therapy started in a, as a split system where a lot of work was done with the hyper side and the mm -hmm. hyper side mm -hmm. wasn't seen or acknowledged or understood. That also was inspired by or supported by that most of the trauma research was done with homecoming soldiers mm -hmm. from the Vietnam War and other... Yeah, yeah, that was the sort of genesis of PTSD. That, there was a big, yeah, big surge in the PTSD research but it means that they, it was done with male soldiers primarily and their types of trauma patterns. 
Right, and that's not an average cross section of people, right? And, no, uh, it's not, the, uh, and it's trauma. not, oh. and it's not the group of people where you will meet most hypo arousal. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Hypo arousal is more common in women than in men. Okay. And com- more common in other types of of um, trauma than you find with surges. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I don't so hear it's, talk about it's, gender differences much in trauma. It's not something I hear people talk about much. No, but they are there. Mm-hmm. Again, I can you believe can it. To, I can believe it. Go to there are different people who have addressed it. Ruth Lanius, Bruce Perry, okay, have addressed it. Um, yeah, those are the ones that come to my okay. mind right Thank now. Thank you. If this might be something to point me towards, I haven't seen much of. And what about the teaching side of it? So we're in this crazy situation now where trauma teachers. I I've seen trauma go from uh, taboo. Like, I'm not traumatized. Yes. No one's traumatized. I'm, you know, yes. People that were yes. clearly traumatized used to say, I'm not traumatized. And yes. then, you know, and then the teachers were these sort of weird, obscure people. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that had this sort of maybe unhealthy interest in the dark side of life. And then now the trauma teachers are sort of global megastars, you know. Uh, yeah. Some of them I found are quite nice. Some of them aren't so much, I've, I've found on the yeah. other side of things. And uh, also that everyone's traumatized now. Everyone's talking about trauma all the yeah. time. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not just like abuse survivors or war veterans that have trauma now. It's uh, middle class girls who got their own kind of chocolate, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, so the, the yeah. world's really changed in its approach yes. to trauma for better yeah. and maybe a little bit for worse. Yeah. You could say there's a, uh, with trauma, uh, you, you can, if you look at it at a spectrum, you can have uh, two extreme ways of looking at trauma. One is called trauma centrality, which I think is what you a little humorously point to, uh, that um, we can, in a way, we can get over-identified with our trauma. I'm a survivor. Yeah. Yeah. And this is who I am. Becomes a big I, I am my trauma, and I become somebody by being traumatized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's actually a quite serious state or it's a serious syndrome. Okay. Uh, and the, the research shows that it worsens PTSD. Okay, because people identify with it. I, I see yeah. people identify with other conditions, alcoholism, you know, ADHD, yeah. autism. I've heard people get, so people that are sort of into their condition, it becomes you part of their identity. kind of stuck with it. Yeah, right. yeah, because it's part of who you are, right? So what are you, how are you going to lose yes. that? Yeah. Yes, and it's hard to work with. But that, so that's one end of the extreme of how we can relate to trauma. Mm. The, other, the other end is, is uh, um, denial, right? Right, yeah, Which no one's You also to pointed mm. to that uh, I'm not traumatized, you know, nothing wrong with me. Uh, yeah. Or minimizing or avoiding or, uh, and in that spectrum also lies the aspect of dissociation where you detach from it. Yeah, yeah. Many Any everyone I've ever met that but, trauma has, has always said, yeah, but I didn't have it so bad. It's like, well, my, yeah. my brother was yeah. beating up more. I don't know, when yeah. he was beating up, but your exactly. dad, it was still pretty heavy. Yeah. So. so you have these these two ends of the spectrum. Mm. And, mm. I mean, it's a really good question. What it is that that supports us in getting a more realistic view on uh, what trauma is, um, how it shows up, um, and what it is we can do about it. There's also been the shift of trauma had to be uh, from a certain event to trauma as a state of yes. the nervous system, or in your case, yes. the muscular system as well, right? Yes. That yes. seems to have been a shift. People are like, okay, PTSD, right. you have to have a threat to life or limb integrity yourself. Now it's yeah. like, it's not so much about the external, it's more about how you yeah. sort of wired the nervous system. Yeah. You know, neuroscience obviously yes. advanced a lot in that time. Yeah. And I'm certainly in that boat. Uh-huh. I'm not. When I work, I'm, I'm uh, the first long, long time, I'm not uh, interest, especially interested in the events. Okay. I am very interested in uh, what skills are available. Mm-hmm. Um, how can we uh, widen? Uh, how can we build up resilience? How can we get access to more, uh, more experience of agency, more experience of inner authority of that I am actually in charge myself. I'm not decided over by my arousal states. I can relate to them. And how do we build, how do we support that? So resources, states. Yeah. 
The third thing I've seen recently, which I used to really push for, and now I'm not sure about, uh, is the politicization of trauma. The, the, maybe yeah. trauma's always had this element, yeah. but I think it was three years ago, I was at a conference and, uh, in London. Big one, good one. And there were several very famous trauma speakers there, some of the most famous in the world. Mm-hmm. And all three of the top speakers all mentioned positive uh, Donald Trump. And they mentioned him in a you know, fairly negative way. And, um, and you know, I can get why. He's not my favorite person either. But I thought, okay, this is really interesting that there are psychologists talking about politics. And yeah. since then, and I, I thought in some ways I thought it was quite positive at the time. And since then, certainly even in the last few months, it just exploded. Like the connection between politics and trauma. And almost like trauma is being weaponized by certain political groups. It's being used or maybe wow. abused by certain political groups to say, well, therefore we have to have these politics. Or because you don't understand trauma, you're a bad person. But I'm seeing it used in a whole new way, particularly in the States, but um, to some extent here. That's interesting. You know, come across this. I <laughs> well, I th- you could say, if I think trauma and politics, mm. I, I start earlier. Um, so I'll, I'll just add that. Because trauma, in a way, has always related to politics. True. Yeah. Yeah. Fr- from the very beginning, if you go down to, to the early days with Freud and Chenet and Charcot <laughs> in Paris, and uh, you had these two French, uh, Chenet and Charcot, who worked with the prostitutes, uh, women from the streets, and worked with the, all their dissociative symptoms, and they were very aware of that they were working with real life events. Mm-hmm. That these women had been abused sexually, violently, etc., and they they had disso- dissociative symptoms because of that, right? In the beginning, Freud joined that, and then at some point, he left that and went into this whole interpretation of that these symptoms were a sign of the Oedipus, Oedipus mm-hmm. complex, imagine fantasies, the word, the word. etc. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That, that event is, is huge in terms of how... So we, we went from that there was the early roots of a realistic um, uh, trauma therapy being done back then to... Uh, going into a psychology that, that did not focus on real life events. Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. I'm saying it in a neutral, a kind way. <laughs> uh, it actually pisses me off. No, I'm hearing I'm that. Honest, too, yeah. that yeah. uh, because it was, I mean, there are books where it's called The Betrayal of the Truth. Uh-huh. There, is, there is some very, very unpleasant reality connected to how societies relate to these events that are in the shadow. Yep, yeah, that's the around. Incest, yeah. Um, uh-huh. homecoming soldiers, you name it. There are so many actually society created mm-hmm. trauma mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. society is very uh, uh, distant from. It becomes the individual's problem. Well, this is this the person thing. is weird, right? Yeah. It's not. It's well, not the society. It's the society sure. doesn't own that we that we have a problem. Mm. That abuse is widespread. That, that violence yes. against women is widespread. It's, that war fucks people up. Yeah. I mean, this is this is something yeah. to be owned, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I saw Bessel van der Kolk uh, was in Denmark in t- 2000, 20 years ago, and did a conference on trauma there, and he described that it's it was still at that time, and I still think it is that in the states if you work with um, domestic uh, abuse if you work with sexual abuse in families with incest etc you are not going to get a career as a psychiatrist Mm -hmm. or psychologist or researcher you're not going to get the money for research no it's and that's where it's trauma has always been political so, yeah, I, I hear you, and I agree with that. There's been a denial of trauma and denial of what causes trauma. Yeah. And that's been the traditional sort of conservative uh, way of getting this wrong. Yeah. And what I'm now seeing is uh, a, yes. new, a new movement yeah. on the left, which is, you yeah. know, for example, people yeah. saying they're triggered. 
Therefore, Mark Walsh has to be cancelled or whoever has to be cancelled. I've been personally affected by this. And that's the triggering. I'm like, you don't even know what a fucking trigger is. This is the language of trauma you're speaking, right? Like, you know, what is the specific trauma that's triggered here? And it, it's a yeah. taking of the... And one reason I worry about this, it takes the language away from people who have trauma and makes it into a weapon. Yeah. And there is a long history of this on the left yeah. as well. Like the communists would say there were mental disorders, yeah. you know, that would be, you're insane if you don't believe in the communist revolution. And there's a long history of people making things that are political, a disorder, uh, and then using this increased care that exists for many of us and not wanting to uh, re-traumatize people and wanting people yeah. to have a, to heal and using that as a, a form of control. Now, that strikes me as something quite new from the, the stuff you've talked about, which I think I completely agree with. It's, it's on the other side of the street. I get that. I get that. It's, uh, and I, I think what you talk about, it, it, uh, for me, it's addressed, or one of the concepts that addresses some of it is this trauma centrality concept. Uh, identifying as that. It's an over-focus on it. Mm, mm, and mm, with mm. that, starting to use... Uh, use it in, in, in different ways, which is really not honoring the true pain of it. It doesn't honor it, and I don't, I don't see it moving towards healing either because there's no, a, like, it hey, if this is useful for me, why would I get rid of it? If it I get victim it. points for this, if I get to control yeah, yeah. people with yeah. this, why would I, why would I let, let go of that? Yeah. So, That's okay. where you really take it into uh, all these defensive positions or stock, stock mm. uh, social roles we can that trauma can be that the, these stark social roles can be put on top of trauma right and protect us against it or we can get stuck in them or that's a whole story in itself and i'm okay. with you that happens okay i think we've balanced that out a little bit there so to come back to the practical here if people feel like they have these hypo states or they want to work with their hypo states any like recommendations for people listening? Maybe they're therapists. Maybe they're just people who are suffering. Yeah, let's go. We could go back to a very concrete, uh, small experiment here, right? Which is that that now if we just before we try to do these comparisons, right? Uh, if we track a place in the body that has this quality of hypo response, what is it we can do with it? And that's where the method I developed uses what's called the dosing principle. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if you want to engage a part that has basically uh, given up or gone flaccid, uh, it's not going to help that you push it. Uh, it's not going to help that you try to release anything either. What's going to be helpful is that you, in a gentle way, build up energy in a dosage that the muscle can tolerate. And that's doing something small. Okay. Right? So an example could be to, um, uh, instead of pushing your feet hard into the ground, you just do a tiny little gentle push with your feet into the ground so that you activate the upgoing movement in your body. Or if we do the fingertips, you put them together. Um, you can do it in your lap. And, I mean, you could do that with physical force then you really use your muscles. You can also do it much smaller, almost go down to the intention of doing it. And if you do that, you still activate some of your tissue, but you do it in a much lighter way, much more subtle way. That's the methodology I developed. And what's the name of the methodology? Where can people find it if they want to kind of look it up and go into it a bit more? They can, they can look for my name or they can look for relational trauma therapy. Relational trauma therapy. And is there a, a just while we're on the subject, I was going to normally say it's right at the end, but as we're here, is there a website that people want to go to for that? There is. Uh, uh, it's three times W and then it's M-O-A-I-K-U. Mo I Ku. This is the name of your system, yeah? The chemical system. Uh, it's the it's the visionary weird name of my system, yes. Yeah, where did it come from? Just a quick aside. Well, because it seems like a, like a haiku, a Japanese you, word or something. Well, you know? you're right. You're right. It's okay. if you if you want to understand it, it's it's a combination of motoric and haiku. Then oh, you right, just right, take right. the H out of it. Okay. Motoric haiku. 
motoric haiku. And haiku, haiku are these uh, uh, very precise, small Japanese poems yes. right, that work through repetition. They, they have the same structure ongoingly. And this, this is the word I found when I was looking for what could I call this approach that I developed. And then what came was this weird word of waiku. But it, it was from putting these together. And it, it fits for me because doing a, this tiny little thing that we did before, just pressing your fingertips a tiny little bit together or pushing your feet a tiny little bit into the floor, that's a very subtle thing to do. It is very precise. It activates something. So if I can do a haiku. Tra yeah. Trauma therapist uh -huh. jumps into the pond hypo. Uh -huh. The sound of nothing. There we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There's a little haiku just for you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Jumps thank you. into the pond of nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the sound of I've <laughs> mucked up already. We used to write quite a lot of haiku. That was a little homage to to a uh, famous one about frog. Yeah. So um, okay, this has been wonderful. We're moving somewhat towards wrap up. So dosing, people have found where they can find you. Is there anything you want to say about sort of trauma that's not widely known that you think would be good to say? And I'm, I'm also keen to ask you about authority. I've got a question here from you you sent me ahead of time. Uh, hypo states and authority. I'm, I'm super keen to know what the link there is. Well, I've, if I do that short, we talked about, just before we talked about the stock roles we can get into around trauma. Mm -hmm. Basically, we can go dominant or submissive. The hypo states, they very easily take us, takes us into submission. Got it. Right? We lose our experience of being in charge ourselves. And for me, that is one very good reason for addressing hypo response. Yes. Because if we can address that in a realistic way, we can start building up people's and our own authority again so that we can decide ourselves the speed we relate to these trauma in. Where one of the big problems with trauma is that they take over. They run our lives in known or unknown ways. So that's, that's the easy link. It's that working with hyper response empowers you so that you can take back your authority. You know, I, 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 one of my hobbies is World War II history. I study World War II history. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of pictures you see of people who are about to be shot. And okay. um, they are often very submissive looking. Yeah. And you often sort of, I often sort of think, um, you know, why aren't they running away? Why aren't they fighting back? They're about to be shot. At least you could try, you know. But then I go, okay, I'm seeing a picture of somebody who's probably been abused for a very long time by, yes. you know, the Nazis or whoever it was, the Japanese, yes. whoever. And um, they're just in a point where now where they're completely submissive. Yes. And, you know, that, that is, I think, not widely known. And there's also something about modern times that with this whole COVID thing that I see people, and it's certainly through parts of the cycle that happened in England when people got very submissive yes. in terms of government regulations. And some of that was maybe for the best, but yes. others I go... I saw people that I was used to thinking for themselves become very, very submissive, and it seemed almost like a trauma response. Um, learn oh, helplessness yeah. kind of thing, you know? Well, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, a situation like the, the COVID-19 situation really challenges authority. And, and either you go into a stuck fight position in it, which some people did, right. or you go into a, a stuck um, uh, adaptation or submission situation and and you we certainly saw both of those polarities play out in different ways in different countries mm -hmm. and the question for all of us no matter if you start in one or the other extreme is how do you actually find your own authority in this situation right right you right. own that you have choices that there there's a situation going on and there are governments who make certain policies and restrictions but how are you going to relate to it and that has a lot to do i think with actually accessing your whole body's resources instead of one part going into hyper and another part going into hypo. Because with that, we are stuck either in fighting or in submissing. Right, right. And none, right. Of, none of it gives us freedom. Right, neither of those are free. Yeah, yeah. Neither of that is, is your true authority, your choices okay. from within, how you're going to handle this situation. 
this is part of the teaching I have done in this period of time. It's actually training people in finding their own inner authority with this situation. Important, really important, because I'm seeing reactivity and I'm seeing yes. submissiveness and not a lot of intelligent kind no. of response. <laughs> Right, really I'm with you. Streams. Yeah. And there is more of that in, in countries who have uh, less uh, balanced leadership. Uh -huh. Put uh -huh. it that way, right? We are uh -huh. lucky in Scandinavia. We are very lucky in Denmark. Yeah. We yeah. have a really good political leadership in this situation. It did um, well under the Nazis too in Denmark in terms of not handing over all the Jews and uh, kind of quite a proud history, I would say, Denmark. Just... Uh, we Shout a, out to Denmark, I would say, on this on this front. We have a very mixed history in Second World War. Mixed, mixed, but mixed. by comparison are, with other poor countries, I would uh, argue mm -hmm. it was reasonably something to be proud of. But oh, yeah. uh, it's my reading of the history anyway. Maybe you, yeah. maybe you can inform me if I miss something. But, uh, okay, so shout out to Denmark. We have quite a lot of Danish listeners, actually. Do you want to hit us with some Danish, just for our Danish listeners, just because they never hear Danish, do they, on podcasts? So uh, a little bit of Danish for any of our Danish listeners. We've got quite a big lot of them. Okay, so if there are some Danish that listen, so hear med. And I hope you have found out of it, and that you give information and that you listen med en anden gang to some of these podcasts. Thank you for your time. Okay, and all our Swedish people are wondering what's going on. They can understand half of it. Probably got a lot of Swedes out there. As far as I'm concerned, bacon they and... They can talk a little Swedish too. A little Swedish too, but it's, shout yeah. out to our Swedish fans yeah. then, because we got... They're like the fifth thing. They can speak a little Swedish too. So you're from Sweden who have listened. Thank you for that you listened to me. And you're hearty welcome to back in another way. Wow, there we go. It's like you suddenly took the marbles out of your mouth. So, uh, excellent. That's a little joke from my Scandinavian friends. So, um, a closing message about the body to finish us up here. Well, if you want to include the hypo parts of you, the, 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 the simplest message is take time, now, take time now and then to slow down and get curious about what's not on board instead of being most curious about what's noisy. Nice. I think it's probably time I did that. Tag, thank you so much for joining us today, Maretta. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it. Um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on EmbodiedFacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook. There, Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you.